Anti-wear additives are an essential component of most lubricants, whether it's engine oils, hydraulic oils, turbine oils, gear oils, anti-wear additives help us protect a lot of those metal surfaces. But exactly how do they work and what are the different kinds of these anti-wear additives? Let's find out. All right, so let's talk about anti-wear additives and their applications. So you'll probably be familiar with something like an engine, right, where we have an engine firing and ZDDP is a very common uh, additive in most engine oils. We've also got things like molyb molybdenum, diphiocarbamate, some titanium based ones as well. Uh, there's a lot of research going into this area. Then obviously in the gear oils, there are a lot of anti-wear additives, particularly in highly loaded gear sets. And the difference between, let's say, an anti-wear and an EP additive is not very clear. However, if we talk about the Strybeck curve, it helps us talk about in what lubrication regimes do we need anti-wear additives. So if you'll remember, the Strybeck curve describes all those lubrication regimes. And when you look at a curve of the coefficient of friction versus this non-dimensional Zn on P, what you see is that it reaches a minimum point and then starts to increase again. Now, what are these three regimes? It's boundary, you've got mixed, and the hydrodynamic lubrication regime. For non-conforming surfaces, that would be elastohydrodynamic. What we're specifically talking about is the boundary and mixed lubrication regimes. And where does that happen is at low values for this ZNRP. What exactly does that mean? The Z term is usually for viscosity, but N represents either speed or RPMs. So in order to have a low ZNRP value, either N needs to be small, so that means slow speed, or alternatively, P, which is the load, could be very high because it's in the denominator, it will make this term smaller. So we're usually talking about slow speed, high load, or a combination of both. So if you remember back to our descriptions of both the mixed and boundary film lubrication. So mixed lubrication is one in which the load is shared between both the fluid as well as the surface asperities. So if you imagine two surfaces sliding behind, between each other, some of the load is being carried by the liquid lubricant film and some is going to be by the actual surface itself. When you start to get into boundary lubrication, we've got full metal to metal contact. And as it slides past each other, all of that load is really being taken by the metal surface. Now we can alleviate uh, some of this situation with additives, right? And so this is where some of the anti-wear additives come in. Now, what kind of anti-wear additives are there? Well, there's a bit of a mix, but we can break them up into two large groups. One is solid lubricants and the other is reactive additives. Now, the solid lubricants are generally particles, right? Molybdenum disulfide, you've got PTFE, which is Teflon, uh, graphite-based ones, as well as boron trifluoride. There are some ceramic additives as well. Now, among the reactive additives, we've got things like fatty acids, ZDDPs, of which there are an entire family of ZDDPs, phosphate-based uh, lubricants like phosphate esters, and uh, sulfur phosphorus compounds as well. So some of these are metal-free, some of these are metal-containing, and that can govern whether it's uh, an ash-based or an ashless anti-wear additive. So as an example, uh, out of ZDDP, is to create something at relatively low cost that has really good uh, anti-wear uh, benefits. Now, the actual creation of ZDDP is uh, a combination of thiosphosphoric acid as well as zinc oxide. So that gives you a bit of a clue. Sometimes we call ZDDP a metal salt, and that's because it's the of the reaction of an acid and a base. So acid plus base makes salt plus water. So when you react thiosphosphoric acid with zinc oxide, what you get is zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate as well as a water molecule. So that's why you'll sometimes hear it referred to as a zinc. Now, what exactly does ZDDP do in the load zone? And I'm using ZDDP because it's by far the most common reactive additive, but we can talk about in future videos some of the variations of ZDDP. So essentially what happens is that you get it approaching the load zone and it is going to adhere to the surface. And the way that these molecules do that is that they need a polar component to them so that the sulfur and the oxygen is going to help give this molecule some polarity. That's going to be drawn to metal surfaces which have charge sitting on their surface. So as it's drawn into the load zone, it's then under pressure, the, the bonds between the sulfur and the zinc break. Now, this bit is not an exact science. We don't have the analytical tools to actually look at this reaction occurring in real time. 
there is a lot of theoretical work that has been done in the academic community, which points to how exactly are ZDDP films formed, right? And this is a theoretical framework for how we think it works. So that zinc sulfur bond breaks, and what you then get is an actual reaction between the, the sulfur and phosphorus components with the actual metal surface itself. What that does over time is to build a, a sort of a glass polyphosphate film. Now, what does that look like at a micro scale? Well, there are a couple of different components to this. So first of all, the actual anti-wear film that we're talking about is extremely small. We're talking in the order of 50 to 150 nanometers. Now, why is this number really important? Well, remember, back to our drawing of the peaks and valleys on a, on a machined surface, that represents the surface finish or the metal asperities. So we can only really protect a, let's say, a metal component if the surface finish is the peak to trough is less than 50 to 150 nanometers, right? Otherwise, the depth of the anti-wear film is not going to be sufficient enough to protect most of our surface. So that's one of the, the key reasons why we put that here. Then we also talk about the other components to it. So generally uh, at the bottom, you have sort of a combination of iron, like an iron sulfide or a zinc sulfide, something like that. Then in the middle, you get this glassy sort of zinc polyphosphate combined with a little bit of the, the metal as well. So a bit of iron in there. And then on top is a pure sort of zinc poly, polyphosphate. Now th this layer that is laid down is almost like a glass type surface. We call this a glass because it's an amorphous mix of different molecules, but it's obviously uh, quite hard right? because it has to be able to take the load uh, that is being put through the two metal surfaces. So in a nutshell, this is how anti-wear additives work. There are obviously variations on it. So the friction modifier, you know, you'll know, you have moly-based or titanium-based ones as well, a boron-based as well. And so they all work in slightly different ways, but this gives you a pretty good idea for the basic function of how an anti-wear additive works.